All right, we're going to start chapter 9, which is the center of mass and linear momentum. Okay, the center of mass of a system of particles is the point that moves as though, one, all of the system's mass were concentrated there, and two, all of the external forces were applied. So to simplify an object, you know, previously we've just said that all of the mass is basically located at one point, and that's what's moving. All right, but sometimes objects are oblong, such as a baseball bat, um, and we can find that center of mass and sort of simplify it so that we say that all the mass is concentrated at this point and that all the forces acting on the object are acting at this singular, singular point. So the picture here shows the center of mass, which is the black dot, of a baseball bat flipped into the air, which follows a parabolic path. But all other points of the bat follow more complicated paths. All right, um, so you can see as we throw it up, the center of mass follows the parabolic path that we would expect to see. Okay, so uh, the center of mass of a system of particles. So a system of particles is going to be um, a group of particles, whether it's an object or whether it's just singular particles, um, each having their own mass. So let's consider a situation in which n particles, so n is just a number, it's just whatever number of particles there are. Oops. Um, they're strung out along the x-axis, all right? So all of them are going to be on one axis, you know, something like this. Now, let the mass of the particles, m1, m2, all the way through mn, um, and let them be located at positions x1, x2, etc., 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 etc. Then, if the total mass is just all the masses added together, right, m1 plus m2 plus m3 all the way through mn, then the location of the center of mass is going to be given as um, the x center of mass. So that will be, so x com, so com is going to be center of mass. That's what we're going to use for center of mass. All right, so the location is simply going to be m1 x1 plus m2 x2 plus m3 x3 plus you know etc 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 all the way through the particles until we get to mn xn right and then you're going to divide that by capital m which is the total mass of all the particles all right so this is going to show you the x position or the x center of mass <clears throat> or excuse me the x position of the center of mass Okay, now this can, this can also be written more simply in a um, summation form, All right? So our x center of mass is going to be one over m. So we're pulling out this one over m here, and that's gonna be multiplied by the summation, and we're just gonna set i is equal to one to n. So basically this is saying, Start at particle one, go all the way through to particle n. All right, so you're encapsulating all the particles that are involved. Um, and then it's just going to be mi xi, right? So it's the sum of m1 x2 plus m2 x3 plus m3 x3, you know, so on and so forth. Okay, so this is our equation for center of mass of a particle if they're along the x-axis. All right, but let's say this, the, you have particles all over the place. Maybe they're all throughout the three axes. So we have to fi find a way to deal with that as well. So in 3D, the locations of the center of mass are simply going to be given by the same equation, but instead of multiplying it by the x component of its um, displacement, we're, mul we're multiplying it by the y component for the y center of mass, and then the x comp or the z component for the z center of mass. All right, so basically, like we've done previously, we're going to split up our position vector into x, y, and z components, and we're going to look at those separately, and then um, we're going to find what the center of mass is for each of those. So we can find the x center of mass, the y center of mass, and the z center of mass. Okay. So the position of the center of mass can also be expressed as far as a, um, as a vector from the origin to some point, right, in 3D space. So this is this would be our r position, which is going to be r center of mass is equal to the x position center of mass along the i direction, 
plus the y center of mass along the j direction plus the z center of mass along the k direction. Okay, and this can also be written as a summation. So this is just going to be the r center of mass is going to be 1 over m times the summation i is equal to 1 to n, so encapsulating all the particles, mi, and then whatever the position vector is, right? Where this r encapsulates the x, the y, and the z component. All right, so what is this, this r vector? Just to make sure we're sure what we're talking about. So if this is our x, y, and z axes, let's call this x, this y, and this z. Let's say we had some particle here, all right, and it it's, has some component of z, y, and x. Let's say that if this is kind of where it hits the axes down here, this is going to be our r vector. Right, so that's all that is. It's just from the, the position from the origin to wherever the particle is. Okay. So in the case of a solid body, the particles become differential mass elements, right? And the sums are going to become integrals. So again, let's say we had, instead of a particle, we have an actual object. Maybe we have a cube or something, kind of like this. All right, and then inside this cube, we're going to have differential mass elements that are in that are three dimensional. So let's just say in here we have maybe a little tiny differential cube, which has a mass of dm. If this whole thing is m, well, let's say, use capital M. If the whole thing's capital M. Then just a little element inside of that cube is going to be dm. So we're going to call that the differential mass element, and the sum of all of these differential elements are going to be integrals, right? And then the coordinates of the center of mass can be defined simply as so instead of just adding the components um, together, we're going to take the integral of all of these differential mass. Uh, mass elements times whatever the position of that element is. Okay, and then we're going to do that again for each x, y, and z. All right, so now we have 1 over m times the integral of x times this differential mass element. All right, and then the same for each of the other ones. Okay, again, big M is going to be the mass of the object, right, the total mass of that object. Now, if the object has a uniform density rho defined as rho is equal to dm dv, right, we know that. The density is going to be the mass divided by the volume, but if you're looking at a differential mass element, you're just going to have the differential mass times a differential vol, or excuse me, divided by a differential volume for the density. All right, and then um, <clears throat> just rearranging this, um, since we know, or since here, let's let's do this. So taking this dm over here, moving this over, this is also equal to v dv is equal to m over dm. And you notice here we have dm over m, right? So if we just flip this over, we get dv over v. And that's what we have here. We have this dv over v. So it can also be expressed um, in terms of the volume, right? Instead of just the mass. Okay. So let's do an example problem. So um, the figure shows that a uniform metal plate P of radius 2R from which a disk of radius R has been stamped out or removed. All right, so here's our disk P, and then inside of that we have a disk, um, and we can maybe call this S, has been removed, right? And it only has a radius of R. Now the disk is shown. Um, use the XY coordinate system shown. Locate the center of mass of P, the plate of the remaining plate, right? So we need to find the center of mass of the remaining plate, right? This is this was the whole plate, and then we removed this plate, so what's the center of mass of what's left? Okay, so first, put the stamped out disk, and we'll call this disk S, back into place, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna take this disk, and we're gonna put it back in, in there um, to form the original plate, and they, we're going to call the original plate C. Right, so C is going to be the original. S was that stamped out bit. Now because of its circular symmetry, the center of mass for S, which is the stamped out disk, 
is at the center of x, so that's at x is equal to negative r. Right, so if here's our origin, currently it's the center of mass of this disk would be at negative r from the x-axis. Right, so this would be negative r. Now similarly, the center of mass of C, which again is the whole disk, um, for the composite plate C is at the center of C, which is at the origin. Right, so the, for this big disk with part of the disk with this um, actually back in there, center of mass is going to be at the origin. Now assume that uh, the mass of disk S is concentrated in a particle at X s, which is negative r. All right, so let's assume that with this, the uh, center of mass is located right there, right? And then all the mass is located right at that point. Now next, treat these two particles as a two-particle system and find their center of mass. All right, so we can do that. We can say that with, if we know their center of masses, we can just assume that all the mass is located at that point, and we can try to find what the overall center of mass would be then. Okay, so the center of mass of the cutout uh, piece plus uh, the whole plate is going to be equal to the equation that we had before. So it's ms times x, s, mp, xp, right, and then divided by the total mass. Now next note that the combination of disk s and plate p is the composite plate c. Right? When you add S and P together, when you add the cutout plate plus this one, you get the composite plate of it together. Thus, the position XP and the center of mass of SP must coincide with the position XC and the center of mass of C, which is at the origin. Right? So we know that if this plate is whole, if this whole plate is whole, center of mass is going to be at the origin, so our position is just going to be zero. Okay, so since this is equal to zero, we can go ahead and take what's remaining and solve for xp. Right, now we do that because we can just get rid of everything here on the bottom. This just goes away because you can just um, <clears throat> multiply both sides by zero. So really all you're left with is what's up here. And you solve that for xp, right, the position the exposition of, of the plate. Okay, now we have this ms over mp, and we know that we can relate this to the density ratio, the thickness ratio times the area ratio, right? Because the density is going to be um, simply the area, excuse me, the mass divided by the area, right? So we can well, we know that the densities of these are going to be the same, so this actually just goes to 1. We know the thicknesses of these are going to be the same, so this is going to go to 1, right? And now we're just left with the difference in areas, right? So ms over mp is actually going to be the area ratio of these two, right? And now this area ratio is going to be, well, the area of s, right, which is the, the whole disk, divided by... Well, the area of P is simply the area of C, which is the composite, minus what is what was um, taken out, right? So that's left, basically just leaves us all of this left, okay? And we know that the position, or the, uh, excuse me, the center of mass position of what was taken out is negative R. All right, so we take this plug it back into our equation up here for ms over p, plug in negative r for that position, right, and then we get this equation. We plug in everything we know, we find out that the position for the center of mass is one-third times r. Okay, and then if we look at it, that's going to be somewhere around here, right? If r is somewhere over here, one-third of that's going to be around there. Okay, so let's do one more example problem uh, with center of mass. Okay, so now we have three particles that we're looking at, and we're trying to find where the center of mass of this system is. We're given the masses for each of the particles, and we know that they form an equilateral triangle with a length of 140 centimeters. Right, so we can find the positions of, of each of these particles, right? And 
basically here are the positions given here. Okay, so the total mass m of the system is 7.1 kilograms, right? So big M is just going to be 7.1. Now the coordinates of the center of mass are therefore going to be, so let's do the x first, right? We want to split out the x and y components. So we start with the x. Now it's going to be 1 over m times the summation of i is equal to 1 and then 3 because we have three different particles. So we're going from 1, 2, and 3. We're going to sum them all together. We have m i x i. Okay. Putting that uh, or writing that out, it's just simply going to be m1 x1 plus m2 x2. Whoops. Plus m3 x3. And that's going to be divided by the total mass. Okay. Plugging in our values, we take our first particle, which is 1.2 kilograms, times the position of zero, because this one is at the axes or the at the origin, right? So its position is going to be zero plus 2.5 kilograms times its position, which is 140 centimeters. Right, so that's this one located over here. This is our mass two plus 3.4 kilograms, which is our third particle, times uh, 70 centimeters, which is up here. This is our third particle, so 70 centimeters is going to be right there. All right, so that's 70 centimeters. Right, and then we just simply divide by the total mass, which is 7.1 kilograms. All right, so we get a value of 83 centimeters, and this is going to be in the x direction. Now, to find our y component, we do the same thing. All right, so we look at the y direction or the y component of everything now. So it's going to be 1 over m times the summation of i is equal to 1 to 3, because there's three particles. M I Y I. So that's going to be M1 Y1 plus M2 Y2 plus M3 Y3 divided by big M. Now we do the same thing. We plug in all of our Y values. So for these two particles, our Y values are going to be zero, right? And then for this particle, the Y value is going to be about 120. So plugging that in, you find a value of 58 centimeters. Okay, so that's going to be um, the y position. So you have 83 centimeters in the x direction, 58 centimeters in the y direction, so your point is right about here. And we should also note that for z it's going to be zero, right, because you have no particles going up, up or down in the z direction. Okay, so let's move on to Newton's second law for a system of particles. The vector equation that governs the motion of the center of mass of such a system of particles is simply going to be given by the sum of forces is equal to the total mass times the acceleration uh, of the center of mass of the system. Right. So what this is saying is that you, know, you can break this down into components. So in the x direction, if you just looked at the x direction, it's simply going to be the total mass times the acceleration of your x um, component y direction, same thing. It's going to need to be the total mass times the y component, and then same for the z direction. All right, so we should note that the net force in the, is the net force, excuse me, F net is the net force of all external forces that act on the system. So forces on one particle of the system from another part of, excuse me, one part of the system from another part of the system, which are internal forces, are not going to be included, right, because they're going to cancel out. Now, the total mass big M is the total mass of the system where M remains constant and the system is said to be closed, right? So the mass is not changing. And the A com is going to be the acceleration of the center of mass of the system. All right, so let's just look at the graphic here. The internal forces of the explosion cannot change the path of its center of mass. Okay, so the fireworks rocket explodes in flight. In the absence of air drag, the center of mass of the fragments would continue to follow the original parabolic path until the fragments began to hit the ground, right? Because 
all, this explosion is causing all internal forces, right? So they're all going to be canceled out in some way. So the center of mass of all these particles is going to follow the same parabolic path that we would expect to see. Okay, so for a system of n particles, m times r, right, which is our, again, this is where we uh, saw our position vector for center of mass. Right, so and this divided by the total m, of course, will get you the, the center of mass. Again, where m's total, uh, the, the total mass and ri are the position vectors of all of the masses. Now, if we take the differential of that, right, we take the derivative, um, then we get the velocity vectors for each of these. Take the derivative of again, and you get the acceleration vectors, where it's going to be the total mass times the acceleration of the center of mass is going to be equal to each particle's mass times its acceleration. Okay, so finally, you know that mass times the acceleration is simply going to be all of the forces added together, right? The, all the vector forces added together. So what remains on the right-hand side of the vector sum of all the external forces that act on the system while the internal forces are canceled out by Newton's third law. All right, so again, these are all the external forces. Okay, so let's do an example. So there's three particles are initially at rest. Each experiences an external force due to bodies outside of the three particle system. All right, so we're talking about external forces here. The directions are indicated and the magnitudes are given as six newtons. So you have six newtons to the left here. You have 12 newtons to up and to the right here at 45 degree angle. And you have 14 newtons to the right. So what is the acceleration of the center of mass of the system, and in what direction does it move? Okay, so we can say the center of mass is going to be somewhere around here. The center of mass of the system will move as if all the mass were there and the net force acted there. All right, so we're going to assume that all the mass is concentrated here and the acceleration or the force is acting at this point. Okay, so using Newton's second law, uh, for the center of mass, we'll just write that down. This is our equation. So the net forces are going to be equal to the total mass times the acceleration of the center of mass, which means we add all of our forces together, which is F1 plus F2 plus F3 is equal to the total mass times the acceleration of the center of mass. All right, this is just the net forces added together. Well, we're trying to find what the acceleration of the system is, so let's go ahead and solve this equation for the acceleration. All right, so the acceleration for the center of mass is simply going to be our F1 plus F2 plus F3 oops, divided by the total mass. Okay, so now that we have the equation set up, we can look at each direction individually. So let's start with the x direction. All right, so the acceleration for the center of mass of the x direction is going to be F1x plus F2x plus F3x divided by the total mass. All right, the values are going to be negative 6 newtons. It's negative because it's going to the left, right? It's going to the, in the negative x direction. Plus, yeah, let me write this down here. So it's going to be negative 6 newtons plus the component in the x direction of our F2 force. So this is going up to the right. So this is going to, be have, to have to be F2 cosine of theta. So this would be then 12 newtons, which is the magnitude of the force, times the cosine of 45. Okay. And then we add 14 newtons, which is our F3. Right? F3 is just strictly to the right take this and divide by our total mass, which is going to be 16 kilograms. And the x component of our acceleration is 1.03 meters a second squared. All right. Now we can do this for the same thing for a y direction. All right. So acceleration of the center of mass of the y direction is going to be f1y plus f2y plus f3y which is going to be zero, because there's no y component of our first force, plus 12 newtons 
times the sine of 45, right, to get the y component of our second force, and then plus zero, because again, there's no y component of our third force. Then we divide by the total mass again, which is 16 kilograms. All right, so our y component ends up being 0 0.530 meters a second squared. All right, so here's our x component, here's our y component. If we wanted to find what the resultant acceleration is, so the acceleration of our center of mass is simply going to be the square root of each of these squares, so it's for 1.03 meters a second squared squared plus 0 0.530 meters a second squared squared. Right, so the acceleration of our center of mass would then be 1.16 meters a second squared. Now, if I write it like this, I also need to show what direction it's in, because this is the resultant vector of our acceleration. To do that, I'm just going to say, use the inverse tangent of our y component divided by the x component, right, and that's going to give us 27 degrees. So it's 1.16 meters a second squared at 27 degrees from the positive x-axis. So it's up and to the right like this. All right, that's where our net force is. Okay, that's it for this, this lecture. We will catch you next time.